So, all right. We are going to try to cover the last sweet topics of physics here today. And so my, my topic of the day is tunneling and radioactive decay. And I have this pretty picture that hopefully will make sense to you by the time we finish today. So let's start off with elementary particles. And you might wonder, why is he starting with that? Well, it is very relevant to what we're doing. And also, this is the only time I get to talk about it, since we're not, we're going to start reviewing tomorrow in class. So, what are the elementary particles? First, what does it mean to be elementary? What do you think it means to be elementary? It doesn't get smaller than that. That's the simplest thing. Okay. So, in other words, it would be the ancient Greek atom idea, right? The fundamental building blocks that everything's made of. And we have two fundamental different types of particles that everything's made of. And then we have a couple more on the side. So they're color-coded here. The lilac things are what we call quarks. The lemon line, line things are leptons. Quarks are particles that interact via the strong nuclear force. Leptons are things that interact, well, half of them, via the electromagnetic force. And so that's the fundamental division between the two, strong nuclear force versus electromagnetic. So in the quarks, the quarks were first theorized by independently Murray Gelman and George Zweig, I think, Z. W-E-I-G. Um, and Zweig wanted to call them aces, and Murray Gelman wanted to call them quarks. Quarks is the one that we use. Quark is a nonsense word that comes from Finnegan's Wake. Um, it, the, the quote is in, I think it's in three quarks from Must Remark or something like that. The, the origination of these quarks is quirky. They were looking at properties they found originally with protons and neutrons and then looking at other particles that they were able to make and they saw certain symmetries. They started labeling things with things like isospin. And okay, we already know what spin is, right? Spin has to do with the magnetic moment. Isospin is something that, or in other words, angle momentum. Isospin is something that acts like angle momentum but isn't. Um, and so they were laying out, so how can we just organize these properties? And Murray Gelman came up with a way of drawing like hexagons. He called it the eightfold way, I believe. Um, he was into that Eastern mysticism stuff. And so we have diagrams that we use that show, and I don't have any of those diagrams, but basically you have... I don't remember if it's proton, neutron there. You have the particles arranged like this, and then you have the, uh, like the charge goes to go like that, or actually, no, that's wrong. The charge goes like this. So things that fall on these lines have certain charges. So this is like plus one, zero, and minus one. And so this would be a proton, this would be a neutron. And then you have isospin that I believe has the vertical axis on those. And so this eightfold way is a way of laying out these different particles so you can read on the table and read on this axis and this axis what the parts properties are. So based on those properties, they proposed that there were particles that had certain things to do with those properties. And based on that, they came up with the idea of these quarks, these little particles that make these up. And they concluded that the proton is made up of an up and up and a down, and a neutron is made of an up, down, and down. Now, where did they get those names up and down? They, they, this picture I drew, and of course, I only put two particles on there. It's got a lot more you know, to fill in those other spots, is made up of, actually, I think it's three different quarks, 
up, down, and strange. And so they have these three. Three quarters from left to mark, right? Um, I think I have that right. And the the first two, they said, okay, these are like your basic things. And so we have charges. And for for gravity, we just call it mass, right? That's the gravitational charge. For electricity, we have two charges, plus and minus. For magnetism, we have two charges, north and south. And so basically, we have two charges here, so they just called them up and down, two things that were comparative. And so the one that is called strains now was also called sideways, for you know, you have up, down, and sideways in between up and down. So there's that first level. Everything that we deal with in life is made up of basically protons, neutrons, and electrons. If you look in that table, these are the things that everything in life is made up. They're the first generation. They're the lowest energy states. But in studying these, they realize, first of all, there is not only one particle named up, up, down. Right? The proton is up, up, down. But there is another particle that's also up, up, down that's a different particle. And if I say there are two particles made out of the same things, but they're different particles, <coughs> I hope you look at me like I'm talking stupid stuff, stupid talk. You know, I mean, it just seems like they should be the same thing. Well, it turns out the difference is in energy states. Einstein said that mass is a form of energy. What's the difference in the two particles? It's the energy state, and of course, with the higher energy state, just like with um, atomic orbitals, you can have different spin states, you can have different isospin states. So the, um, I can't remember the name of the particle that is also an up-up-down but a higher energy. But because it has a higher energy, what do you suppose that means for the mass? It has a higher mass as well. In fact, if you look at this, let's look at these masses real quick. An up particle has a mass of about 2.4 mega electron volts. A down is about 4.8. So an up, up, down <coughs> would be 2 times 2.4 plus 4.8. So that's going to be... 9.6 9.6 MeV per C squared is the total mass that you would get for a proton if it was just the sum of the masses of the three quarks. But what is the mass of a proton? Roughly 939 MeV per C squared. Or about... 100 times more than that. So how does it get that extra mass? Energy. It's energy. You said how it's found, right? It's my idea. So it's energy. It's in a higher energy state and thus has higher mass. And then you say, well, how is it possible that the proton's in a higher energy state? Shouldn't it fall down to a lower energy state? And here's where things get confusing a little. You never, ever, ever find a quark by itself. Scientists have never found a quark by itself. And the reason, as we understand it, is they have much, much, much higher energy when they're by themselves than when they're bound together. And so energetically, you're not going to find them alone. You always find them bound to something. So. These masses, of course, it takes a little bit of work to get to these theoretical masses since you never find them by themselves. And when you find them bound together in a proton, they're, of course, at higher energy levels. But most of the mass of a proton is in energy, not in actual the matter that made it up, which, you know, I find really intriguing. Otherwise, I wouldn't talk about it. I also find it intriguing that now I can't erase that. See what else has failed. Okay, so they had the up and down quarks. They noticed some strange behaviors 
Strange behaviors like some radioactive decay processes didn't occur that should occur, or maybe I should say they occurred um, slowly or you know, were loud and didn't occur. They said there's really strange behavior. And that's actually the origin of that name strange. Because it turns out that it has to do with this, well, it has to do with the weak nuclear force, why it had this strange behavior. So they named the particle that was involved the strange particle because it led to strange behavior. And in a little bit, I'll, I'll show you what was strange about it. But then their theory said that you have to have complementary pairs, like you have up and down, so there has to be a paired one with strange, but they couldn't find it. So they said the complementary one must lead a charmed life. And so they call it charm because it led a charmed life. And then as they continued to develop their theory, they theorized that there had to be two more. It was actually, they had found by then the tau lepton, and they said we should have another generation of the quarks to go along with that third generation of leptons. And so they had to come up with two more complementary names, and so they just chose top and bottom. And of course, physicists like me think that top and bottom is just really boring. I mean, you have strange and charm, and then you go to top and bottom. So there are alternative names <laughs> for those last two quarks, truth and beauty, which is much more whimsical and physicist-like in name. So these are the quarks, and everything you deal with is, okay, the quarks are above the line here. Everything you deal with is just the first generation. Why not the second generation or the third generation? Well, if I zoom in, by the way, most of my graphics today came from Wikipedia just to give um, you know, credit. The mass of the charm, how does that compare to the mass of the up? Yeah, it's like 500 times bigger. And then the mass of the top, it's about another 120 or I don't I didn't calculate it, but you know, more than 100 times bigger again. So the masses in these higher families are much higher. They're higher energies, which means that to make them, you have to have really high energy particles to make them. Hence, the particle accelerators. To get high energy particles so that you can collide them together and make these higher energy things. So that top quark was the last one to be identified. It was identified in, I think, 1995. Huge paper with, I swear it has something like 200 authors, I could be off by a factor of two there, but everybody wanted to be in on it because that was, it was the challenge of the day that was of course replaced by the search for the Higgs boson, which has now been identified, and so now the challenge of the day, the only one that remains is finding, well the only one that remains for today's challenge of the day is to find the graviton. Now let's continue on with this, so the quarks, are the things that make up protons and neutrons? Yes. You said we only deal with the first generation there. Yes. Are the second and third generations just higher energy states of the first generation, or are they entirely distinct? Um, they are distinct particles, but they are particles that can decay. They don't break into something else, but they can have their energy converted into something else. Right, so they're still elementary. They can't break into something else but they can have their energy converted into something else. But they, they can be created from high energy states. Yes. So you can, well, all of these particles you can create and destroy. You can change from energy to mass and back and forth. But the way you do it, of course, is pretty constrained, right? You have to have conservation of energy, conservation of momentum, and so on. Okay, the leptons. The leptons are different from the quarks in that they do not interact via the strong nuclear force. The quarks do interact via the electromagnetic force, but in terms of strength, the electromagnetic force is much weaker. You know, I was going to get this out, and then I was helping the gentleman and forgot. Can somebody just come out and bring out a poster real quick? Okay. 
So we're going to put this down in front of the podium so you can look at it while I talk about things. So when things come up, you can refer back to it. So this is our current understanding of the fundamental particles. You can see over here the leptons. You have the different flavors of the lepton, the electron, muon, and tau, and then the neutrinos for each. You'll notice that instead of calling it an electron neutrino, it's called the lightest neutrino. That is one of the cool recent discoveries. That cool recent discovery, by recent, I mean recent to me, maybe not so much to you, but in the last, oh, 20 years, they've discovered that neutrinos actually have a mass. Before that, it was theorized they may or they may not. And it made a difference to their models. If they had no mass, if they were like photons, <coughs> then they would be stuck as one type of neutrino. And so we used to call it the electron neutrino, the muon neutrino, and the tau neutrino. But now, since they have mass, the theory says that they can actually shift around, that these neutrinos exist in a superposition state. And when you measure, you're going to measure just one of them, but they're in a superposition state. It's all three at once. And they have different masses and energies associated with which superposition state it's in, but you still can find any of the three. So this neutrino story has gotten more rich, but it's really important to our understanding of how the sun works. How does the sun produce this energy? Fusion and hydrogen to helium. Why do you believe that? Because <laughs> I said it. Okay, and then you see that's a, that's a horrible reason to believe things, but what else are you going to do, right? You're not going to run an experiment of your own. You're not going to make your own sun and say, now let's see what happens. Well, the scientists can't make their own sun either, but what they can do is they can do things like theorize how hydrogen fusion should occur and actually make hydrogen fusion occur. And when the hydrogen fusion occurs, it creates electron neutrinos. And so looking at how much energy is radiated by the sun, it's pretty easy to calculate the total, you know, how much energy comes through each fusion. You can calculate how many fusions per second it must be making. And for each fusion, it's creating, I think it's two electron neutrinos. And so then you can calculate how many electron neutrinos are leaving the sun each second based on geometry, how many should be striking the earth each second. Now these neutrinos, because they're virtually no mass and zero charge, they go right through us, right? They don't bother me. But they build detectors that have a very low probability, but a probability they can calculate, of absorbing the neutrino and giving a flash of light. And so then they, basically what they do is they take old abandoned underground mines and they make a big chamber, flood it with water, put a bunch of photomultiplier tubes to look for little flashes of light. And those flashes of light are the result of the electron neutrino being absorbed and then the energy being emitted as light. And so they counted the neutrinos that they see coming from the sun. And they found one third as many as they expected. Now, we being scientists, we know we've got this whole scientific method, and you have <coughs> testable predictions. They just tested one of the predictions, and it came out wrong. So what did the scientists do? They go back and have to modify the hypothesis. Well, in this case, after a lot of study, I mean, of course, you're starting to pull your head out. You know, I had already given Hans Beta the Nobel Prize for coming up with this theory, and now all of a sudden it's not working out. It turned out that it was this act, this fact that you have the superposition state that explain their answers, that when they're created, they're going to be created as the electron neutrinos. But because they're in a superposition state, you get here to Earth, and when you measure, it could be any one of the three. And so statistically, you're going to have one-third of electron, one-third muon, one-third tau when you measure them. And then it made sense. The fact that they got one-third as much actually matched the theory once they understood more about the neutrinos. Now, 
let's go on with this. The electron, the up and down, all of them have charge. They all interact via electromagnetic force. But the quarks only interact, um, they're the only ones that interact via the strong nuclear force. The, notice the numbers, the charge. The charge of the up quark is two-thirds. We've said that charge always comes in integer multiples of an electron. That's two-thirds the charge of an electron. The reason we stick with it always coming in integer multiples is because when you combine quarks, the two common ways of combining, there are other options like five and seven, but the way they come is like this. We have an up, up. The, that was supposed to have been a D for down. I put P for proton instead. An up, up, down, that's three quarks. Baryons are particles that are made up of three quarks. And so if you take three quarks, notice the quarks have either plus two-thirds or minus one-third. If I add three of the two-thirds charged together, that's going to give me a charge of two. If I take three of the minus one-thirds, it'll give me a charge of minus one. And if I mix them, I can get charges of one and zero. And so the charges come out to be integer charges there. But baryons, heavy particle, baryon means heavy particle. It's not the only kind of hadron. Hadrons are particles made out of quarks. The hadron means it's the strong. They're, they're held together by the strong force. So the hadrons has the two types, and mesons are quark-antiquark -quark pair. So a, a meson might be an up, anti-down. Well, if I take the up, it has a charge of two-thirds. The down has a charge of minus one-third. The anti has the opposite charge. So the anti-down has a charge of plus one-third. Two-thirds plus one-third is one. So once again, the mesons, the quark-antiquark -quark pairs, always come out with integer charge values again. So that's why we stick with charge always comes with integer values. Um, before I leave this chart, let's get over here to this column, the gauge bosons. They're called gauge bosons because they have to do with the theory called the gauge theory. What's important about the gauge bosons are these are the particles that mediate forces. And when I say a particle mediates a force, first you have to know what it means to say it mediates a force. And then you have to scratch your head and say, what is that? How does that happen? So what does it mean to mediate a force? It means it's what causes the force. It's the thing you have an intermediary between two particles that makes them have a force. And so now we say that the forces are caused by particles. And you're like, how is that going to work out? Well, it works out like this. This tennis ball is going to be my particle that mediates a force. And so I'm going to take this tennis ball, and I'm going to throw it to Jonathan. So when I throw it, as I was throwing it, it was pushing me back, right? I was pushing it forward, it was pushing me back. So that was a force put on me by the tennis ball. When Jonathan caught it, it put a force on him that direction. And so it put a force on both of us, and that's what we mean by saying that it mediates the force. And so the particle that mediates the strong nluclear force is that thing called a gluon. Now, here's the weirdest thing of all. You can make a glue ball. That is, it's possible to have a bunch of these particles that mediate the strong nuclear force form their own particle. <coughs> it's called a glue ball. The photon, well, you know what a photon is. What's a photon? It's a particle of light. The photon is the particle that mediates the electromagnetic force. Then we have the Z and the W. There's two Ws, the W plus and the W minus. The Z and W are the particles that mediate the weak nuclear force. There's one more that's not on there. It's because it's theoretical, hypothetical. That's the graviton, the particle that mediates the gravitational force. So the theory says that we should have things with mass or basically throwing out an object. Sorry, I didn't. Throwing out an object 
And when we catch that object, that's where the gravitational force acts on us. So the Gage bosons are particles that mediate the forces. Now, finally, it has the Higgs boson. It's a scalar boson instead of a Gage boson. Um, the Higgs boson is the one that explains why these two lower Gage bosons, the one that, have, that mediate the weak force, have mass to them. So it's really complicated. I couldn't tell you how it works because I don't understand it. But that's the Higgs boson is a scalar boson. Basically, you do all of this really complicated matrix um, math, and one solution you get to these complicated equations is a scalar boson. Now, we're not going to worry about here what, what's the difference in a, a gauge boson, which is a vector boson, versus a scalar boson. Um, but that's, that's what the big deal is with the Higgs boson. What does it mean for something to be a boson? have an integer spin. So if you look at all of those gauge bosons, they all have spins of one. If you look at the Higgs boson, it has a spin of zero. Those are integers. That's why they're bosons. If you look at the quarks and the leptons, they all have spins of one half. They're fermions. The things that are fermions have to obey the Pauli exclusion principle. Things that are bosons don't. Yeah. Can you have negative spins on bosons? Um, yes, the antiparticles do. Okay, that's a lot for this one picture. A lot more time than I anticipate spending on it. Um, just talking about the different forces. Starting to study nuclei, people start inventing new forces. The strong nuclear force is the force that holds the nucleus together. The strong nuclear force is a very, very strong force. It's the strongest of our forces. If you look here, um, this chart here is ranking the forces. The strong forces, the strongest. Now, you always have to take into account what is your separation, right? Take, for instance, electromagnetic force. Drops off 1 over r squared. The strong nuclear force is a very, very short range. So if you have two nucleons that are separated by the size of a neutron or less, there's going to be a very strong force holding them together. So it's an attractive force. It's attractive for all particles that interact via the strong nuclear force. So the quarks are held together regardless of their charge, regardless of their flavor. We call the up, down, and so on, different flavors of quarks. Regardless of the charge, regardless of their flavor, they're held together by this strong nuclear force as long as they're, you know, separated by no more than the size of a nucleon, the size of, let's say, a neutron. You separate them by more than that, and there's virtually no force. The strong nuclear force just drops off. So if you go to long ranges, the strong nuclear force is going to be the weakest. But at very short distances, it's the strongest. Then we have the, um, actually, I said that was in terms of strength, and it does not have... That's not the one that's in terms of strength because it should have had gravity at the bottom. The, oh, it's, it's going like this from strongest to weakest this way. Weakest, next, stronger, strongest. So electro, electromagnetic is next stronger, then the weak, and then finally gravitational. Now, so <clears throat> the nuclear force is the strongest. The strong nuclear force is the strongest, hence the term strong, and its range is only about that of a nuclear. A nucleon. The weak nuclear force is the one that's responsible for radioactive decay. It was proposed to explain these things. One of the really bizarre things about the weak nuclear force is that it allows quark flavor to change. I underlined the wrong thing there. The quark flavor change. So you can change from an up quark to a down quark if you have a process that's mediated by the weak nuclear force. That's the reason for that strange behavior. You had quarks changing flavors. So this picture here, once again, comes from Wikipedia. This is illustrating a beta decay. The beta decay, this is called a Feynman diagram. 
Richard Feynman, his autobiography, not autobiography, excuse me, his biography is entitled Genius. You may come out in and join the lecture. <laughs> Um, actually, why don't you put in the room next door? It's open. Okay, so this Feynman diagram has time on one axis and position on the other. So here, time is going the vertical axis. So this is the beginning. Okay, beginning. And this is the end. So you start here with a neutron. And then it produces a proton plus a W minus but then the W minus decays into the electron and the electron antineutrino. So there is no, no number typically here, but there's going to be a, that's putting the numbers that are associated with the number of protons and the number of neutrons. They're not exactly right, of course, because there are no protons. There's obviously not a negative one proton in the W particle, but that's how you can add these things up to have conservation of your you know, baryon number, the top level, and basically charge at the bottom one now. So that's how a beta decay actually occurs. You had the down particle went to lower energy, disappeared, created a W and an up. <coughs> and that W minus then lasted for a short time. You can see there is a little vertical motion there. And then it decayed into the electron and the electron antineutrino. Now there's one thing that is confusing about these Feynman diagrams, only one. Antiparticles, the arrows go the wrong direction. So the arrow going down and to the left for the anti-neutrino means that the particle went up and to the right. That's an idiosyncrasy that helps us with math, but looks really funny. So this is a Feynman diagram. I believe this is the main thing he got his Nobel Prize for was having a graphical way to illustrate how these things occur. Not the only thing. He did a lot of calculations and stuff um, on these particles. Richard Feynman was the youngest person in the Manhattan Project. He, he's a actually outstanding, amazing person who, like other crazy physicists, was also very unique. And yeah, let's just go with unique. Yeah. Step aside. Just a bit. Step aside. Okay. In 1968, this weak nuclear force and the electromagnetic force were shown to be two different aspects of the same force. Now this was a big, bold step forward for physicists. Physicists like Albert Einstein spent enormous amounts of time trying to find grand <coughs> unifying theories. Theories that unify all the forces to being one force that we're just seeing different aspects of it. Now keep in mind, we already have an example of this. For, for light, we have the wave-particle duality. And now we believe that everything has a wave-particle duality, right? That there's two aspects of the same thing. And so scientists believe that we should be able to find a grand unifying theory that combines all the forces into one fundamental force. And it's just in this situation, it works this way. In this situation, it works this way. But the only success so far is this combining the electromagnetic force and the weak nuclear force into the electroweak force. Okay, next two forces, ones you know. Electromagnetic force and gravitational force. The weak and strong nuclear forces are called nuclear forces because they are only applicable when you're at nuclear separations. So for everything that's not that separation, we don't experience those. So everything we experience in our daily lives is just electromagnetic or gravitational force. And those are both long-range forces. They have inverse square laws, that is, the force is equal to a constant times charge one times charge two over the separation squared. The constant is K for the electromagnetic force, G for the, mag for the gravitational force. The charges are electric charge or mass, depending on which force you are. And then one over R squared. 
I already said the photons are mediated by the light, the, uh, they mediate the electromagnetic and gravitons theoretical particles mediate the gravitational force. We are today much closer to having information about graviton than we were a year ago today. Why? Because gravitational wave has finally been identified, right? That happened at the very beginning of the school year. So with gravitational wave identified, then using the wave particle duality ideas, you are starting to identify properties of the graviton so that, you know, a few more observations and maybe we can believe we've isolated the graviton. The symbol for the graviton is a capital G. The lowercase g is a gluon. So this diagram is another Feynman diagram. What's different about this Feynman diagram compared to the other one? Yeah. It's kind of annoying that sometimes time is the vertical axis and sometimes it's the horizontal axis. But I was glad that I had one of each simply so you can see the two options. I've never seen any option other than those two. Notice this here is an E plus. What is an E plus? It's a positron or an anti-electron. And so the arrow going down to the left means that the positron is traveling what direction? Up and to the right. So we have the electron and the positron come together in this picture. When they come together, when particle meets its antiparticle, we have annihilation. Now that's what I always teach people. Because if they actually come together, they will annihilate. But believe it or not, you can make positronium. You can make an electron and a positron orbit each other. You have to have the right spin state. If you have the wrong spin state, they will touch each other and go. <laughs> but if you have the right spin state, you can make them so they orbit each other. So if they come together, they annihilate. And what did they create? A photon. This gamma is our symbol for the photon. And then that gamma decayed. What do you suppose Q stands for? It stands for quark. It stands for a category. It could be up, anti-up, down, anti-down, strange, anti-strange, and so on. <coughs> right? You, you can produce a quark pair. Of course, if you're going to produce an up, anti-up, your total energy is going to have to be twice the rest energy of an up quark. If you're going to create a charm, anti-charm, it's going to be have, have to be twice the um, mass you know, energy of the charm, which is much, much higher energy. So usually, you're probably not going to have enough energy to create anything except for the up, anti-up. You'd have to have these electron and positron shooting each other really, really fast to have enough energy created in this photon to make the higher particles. So how did they isolate that top quark? They went up to Fermi Lab in, was it Batavia? <coughs> and they had one ring of protons, um, protons, yeah, protons, and another ring of antiprotons, and they smashed them into each other. I think it was protons and antiprotons. It could have been electrons, anti-electrons. You protons, antiprotons. You have a lot more mass. There's a lot more energy associated, and that's how they got enough energy in there. What they call their tevatron. Was tevatron? Teva? Terra electron volts. They were able to make collisions in the Terra electron volts, a high enough energy to produce these particles that have a mass. If you look at the top quark of 173 gig electron volts per C squared, it's going to produce a, a top anti top pair. You, you're 350 giga electron volts necessary to do that. Plus, you have to have, well, you know, the conservation things mean it's going to be a little higher probably. Okay. <sighs> I'm now ready to start the lecture. That was our background material. So how does, and I'm only going to look at alpha decay. How does alpha decay occur? First, we have a nucleus. The nucleus, as long as you have atoms that are, or atoms, protons and neutrons that are packed together, nucleus close enough to each other, they're 
going to have that strong nuclear force, which is very highly attractive, and so it creates that low energy. So the low part of this diagram is basically where we have the radius of the nucleus. So let's say the radius of the nucleus comes out to about there. And so as long as you have something within that range in the nucleus, it's bound tightly together, you have a low potential energy. But if it goes any farther, if it breaks free, if it's more than you know, the size of a neutron away from the rest of the nucleus, suddenly all of that disappears. And then you just have the electrostatic repulsion. That electrostatic repulsion is going to be a positive energy, and so you're in this part right here, transitioning from the electro from the strong nuclear force dominating to the electromagnetic force dominating. Well, you have the alpha particle might have an energy that's this high. Is that high enough to get over the wall? No is the correct answer. Trying to change to the black pin. Okay. So here's your energy. It's not high enough to get over that wall. And so in theory, your nucleus can't decay because you don't have enough energy for the alpha to get out. But in practice, it does. So that gets us to the idea of quantum tunneling. <laughs> I was going to do another quantum problem. We did the, pro the particle in a box problem. We, the next problem after that is the particle in a finite well. If it's in a finite well, you don't go up to infinity potential energy, right? You go up to a finite potential energy. Well, it's always possible to have a finite energy. And so it turns out that when you solve the problem for a finite well, so if I make a well that's finite, my particle is going to have something very similar to the wave function we found inside. Not exactly the same, but similar. It's going to have a wave function. So in the ground state, it's something like, okay, change color, sorry. Oh, come on. I can scroll. There we go. At least it came back. So it's going to have something like this. Notice it's a little bit different there at the edge. But then when you get to the part outside, if the energy is lower than the boundaries, in a real life situation, if the energy is lower than the height of the box, you can never have your ping pong ball get out of the box. But in quantum physics, there's a finite probability that's just going to asymptote to zero the farther away you get. It's something that follows e to the minus alpha x on this side and e to the alpha x on that side. The reason there's a minus on one side and not on the other is because x is positive on one side and x is negative on the other. So you have those exponential decays. But in quantum physics, we say if the, if the wave function is not zero, there's a certain probability that the particle is out there. So there's a certain probability that the particle is outside of the box when it doesn't have enough energy to get out of the box. Well, if you modify that box by... making it so there's just a finite width to the box, then outside here, the particle has enough energy to exist again. And so it's going to have its wave function, still going to have the asymptotic decay in the region where it doesn't have enough energy, but then it's just going to be a traveling wave out here. So what does all of this say? If you take, you know, it's mathematical getting those results. But then if you take the mean of quantum physics, that means that there's a certain probability of a particle that's in the box to become outside the box. And once it's outside the box, it's just going to travel on away. And that probability of it getting through the barrier that doesn't have enough energy to get through is going to get bigger if that barrier gets smaller, smaller, smaller. It's also going to get bigger if the barrier is smaller. So the taller the barrier, the wider the barrier, the harder it is for it to get through. We call this process tunneling because in a practical sense, if you are in prison and you can't jump over the wall, you could still get out by tunneling underneath it. That's where the term comes from.
And so we're saying that the electron, or in this case, alpha particles in the nucleus, they don't have enough energy to get out of the nucleus. They don't have enough energy to go over the barrier here. But they can tunnel through and they'll have the same energy outside. They just, they were inside, now they're outside. Magic. That's how quantum physics works. And you can understand why it's, when you take a class in quantum physics, you have to do a whole lot of you know, soul searching. How am I going to believe this stuff? So, uh, was it here? Yeah, I actually had the equation. The probability, this T is the tunneling probability. The probability of a particle getting out of a well is found by taking this E raised to minus two. The two is there because it's a square. Remember, you have to do mod squared for probabilities. That's where the two comes from. Integral of square root of 2m over h bar squared times the potential energy minus the overall energy, the total energy. So if potential energy is higher than the overall energy, then you have a barrier when you do this. If potential energy was less than E, there would be no point in doing this. You have enough energy to just get out. And so you do that integral, and you can calculate the tunneling probability, the likelihood of an alpha particle, in this case, getting out of the nucleus. And so then how does that relate to our radioactive decay? Well, the probability of tunneling, and that was T sub E, probability of tunneling is a function of energy, multiplied by the number of collisions per second. So we can calculate, okay, so if the alpha particle has this energy, it has this kinetic energy, which means that it's going back and forth at this speed, which means it hits a wall once every train of time. <coughs> so we can calculate how often the alpha particle is going to hit the wall, and each time it hits the wall, it has that probability of going through the wall. <coughs> and that gives us the decay constant. Now, I have to tell you, this is not finished science. This gets you within, you know, plus or minus 50%. Gives you order of magnitude answers. It doesn't give you the exact decay constant. And that's because, you know, we don't really understand what's going on inside the nucleus perfectly well. We've got a lot of theories based on symmetries that have been seen, but we don't have the final answer. So this doesn't give you the exact decay constant, it just gets you in the ballpark. But we consider it a great success because we can take different atoms and calculate what the decay constant should be and measure it, and they're in the right ballpark. You know, this one here should be much higher. Hey, look, it is much higher type of thing. So that is the underpinnings of why radioactive decay occurs. Because you have a situation like, I mean, this was only alpha decay. The beta decay you saw was a fundamentally different kind of calculation with the W particle created. But, and you have to do a different calculation for the beta decay clearly. But you can see how the quantum physics combined with our understanding of the forces to give us the potential energy function predict radioactive decay. That's the end. Questions? Anybody want me to go back and do the uh, particle in the finite box? <laughs> sure. We got 20 minutes to tell. Yes. With the uh, still second and third generation or uh, quarks. Mm -hmm. Why do they exist if we never interact with them at the current energy? Well, state of the universe? yeah, they, they randomly exist because of very high energy things going on around us, but that's randomly and very rarely. So to study them, we basically make them, right? You can make something like a cloud chamber, and when you have a radioactive decay, you'll have really high energy emissions, and you can see some of these crazy things. But to really understand them, a lot of times we're just banging things together really hard. And so we justify spending billions of dollars to make these high energy collisions so we can understand more about the fundamental nature of the universe 
and how the forces work. And you might say, how does that benefit mankind? I mean, it's got a logical outcome. You spend a lot of money. How's it benefit us? And the best answer I can give is to point to other scientific advances. You know, understanding quantum theory and tunneling allows us to then predict, hey, we can make transistors that instead of having a vacuum tube with a screen and another screen and you know, shooting electrons through, we can just make it using semiconductors. It's revolutionized our world. So what would be esoteric science that's throwing millions, billions of dollars at for no seemingly reward, we find, hey, look, there was a lot of reward. There's a question. How do we know that fundamental particle, particles are fundamental? Is there like a specific type of experiment that you can do to reward? Um, that, that's, that's a question that I'm not able to perfectly answer. Um, you know, as, as far as we know, you know, you can't, an electron can't decay, and the quarks, the, you know, the up and down don't decay, the other ones will decay, but they're not breaking down. <coughs> How do we know that they're fundamental? I, I don't have an answer. When they decay, are they just releasing energy in some way, or? Um, yes. And so, like, you know, I didn't look anything for today on how, like, for instance, the top quark decays. But the top quark doesn't stick around. You make it, first of all, you don't make it by itself. It's always going to be with something else, bound to something else, not in isolation. And then it's going to, you know, using the weak nuclear force, weak nuclear force? That's got to be strong nuclear force. It's going to decay and actually, it can't change quark flavor. It's got to be the weak nuclear force for it to decay and produce lower energy cores. So in the decay, it produces something entirely unique from what it was. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> it, the, the thing that got me with all of this study was realizing <coughs> that everything comes back to what are we measuring? We measure bursts of energy. We measure angular momentum, you know, charge. And from that, we infer a particle. Um, yes, and um, you, you can you can get actually if you want to come to my office, I've got the books that show all the different particles that they've made and whatnot. Um, you can you can look online and find it. Um, but yeah, they, I don't think there are very many things at all that have been discovered with top in them. Um, there are, there are some with B, um, you know, like Bear Beauty, um, B anti B. Um, but yeah, it's a very limited number of things we found. I think bear beauty is B anti B. They also call it naked beauty. Um, okay, I'll see you for lab. Everybody's lab project copacetic. <laughs>